I could begin um, with uh, Dr. Hannah Bargawi. Uh, she's presenting jointly with uh, Professor Terry McKinley from SOAS in the UK. Uh, both are based in University of London and uh, have an interesting uh, perspective in relation to um, a global model out to the year 2030. It's really interesting uh, work that they're doing on, on a global and European level. So I hand over first of all to Dr. Hanna, if that is okay. Yeah. Um, I have a presentation which hopefully I can get up here. Oh, brilliant, it's already there. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you very much to TASC and, and FEPS for hosting us. Um, thank you, Tom. So what I'm presenting here today, together with Terry McKinley, is a bit of a sort of bigger picture, really. Um, and the title is Alternatives to Austerity for Europe, Developing an Employment-Focused Strategy. Now, I'll give you a little bit of sort of background and context to, to what this is all about. Um, this started as an uh, EU-funded FP7 project uh, called Algor and Europe and the World in 2030. There's the website if you're interested. This was a project that um, we at SOAS University of London were um, involved in with a number of other partners across Europe. And it was really projecting into the future where Europe might be across a number of different themes, both economic but also looking at um, demographic issues, um, energy issues, trying to see where Europe might be within the world um, in 2030. So it was using a global macroeconomic model at its heart, which is the SOWE or CAM model. SOWE stands for State of the World Economy um, Macro Model. And the, really the origins of that model um, date back to the 1970s, were developed at Cambridge University by a number of academics there. It's, a, it's an interesting model in that it's um, sort of historically calibrated. So it's based on um, data that starts in the 1970s and broad behavioral trends that um, have occurred since are used to project into the future up to 2030. So that's what we're presenting here. Now this is a global model. So um, looking at detail for particular countries is very, very difficult and, and um, probably shouldn't be done with this model. It's really to try and look at different policy scenarios and to compare between um, those scenarios. So this is not to look at uh, you know, the detail for Ireland for a particular year in, in 2020, what might be GDP growth. It's more to compare trends between different scenario, policy scenarios. So what we're presenting here today is really ongoing work, and this is work that we're um, doing together with FEPS and with ECLM, and Lars will be presenting um, his part of, of, of that work um, on this panel too. So really it's sort of work in progress which is partially why I'm handing over to Terry to deal with the sort of nitty gritty problems we're currently encountering um, and to present some ideas how we're going to progress. So I'm going to focus here on two different scenarios. One is we've called it continued austerity um, but it's really looking at what if policies don't change in Europe? What if we carry on to sort of muddle through a struggle on with the current setup? Um, with the current policies that, that um, are in place, and no real institutional changes at the European level. And then an alternative scenario, which is more looking at, if we put employment at the heart of macroeconomic policy, what could that do to um, sort of major macroeconomic um, factors in Europe? So just very briefly, to tell you a bit about the model, the world is divided into 19 blocks. Um, I've already explained it's a historical series that starts in the 1970s and the scenarios project from 2013 up to 2030. There's a number of behavioural equations and accounting identities and Europe, which is what we're going to focus on here today, is split into five blocks. Now the first thing I'm sure, given that we're in Dublin here today, you'll see is that Ireland is um, categorised under South Europe. Um, <laughs> now this is purely for structural reasons in that it shares more in common with the other countries in that block than it does with countries in other blocks. So for example, it's part of the Eurozone, otherwise it could be in a block with the UK. And structurally, it, it um, has more features in common with those other countries. So I apologise in advance that you'll keep on seeing South Europe flash up, and that does include Ireland. Um, the focus here is very much on the medium to long term, and um, like I said, outcomes of different policy scenarios for Europe. 
We'll focus on the blocks which are west. So this is France, Germany, some people might call it the core um, of Europe. South Europe, um, which people might want to term the periphery. East Europe and the UK. We'll focus on those regions today. So what do the two different scenarios look like? The first one is, like I said, the sort of struggle on with, with existing policy scenario. And our overriding objective in this scenario is, is pretty much keeping in line with the Maastricht Treaty. So achieving a government debt to GDP ratio of 60% over time via expenditure cuts, government expenditure cuts. Investment remains subdued and government revenue remains close to historically low levels. So in order to create an alternative scenario, we, we wanted to boost employment and that be our central objective. Um, so we've done that by, by arguing that um, employment does need to rise. This needs to be an objective um, for Europe. Um, and we've done it along sort of histor historical lines that it should keep a pace. Um, how is this achieved? So we try and, and boost employment via government spending, and that includes public investment and a stimulus to private investment. And there's a complementary policy, which is to increase government re revenue so that deficits don't spiral out of control. And at the moment, we haven't put anything in, in in terms of exchange rate policies. And that's where we're really sort of, that's the thorny issue that we're going to come to and that Terry's going to talk about in a moment. So what does it look like in terms of these two scenarios when you compare them with each other? Well, first things first is GDP growth. Now, this is an average of 2012 to 2030. The, the um, blocks so on your left-hand side, the blue scenario is the austerity scenario. So if we just carry on as, as we are at the moment and continue with the same policies over a longer period of time, you can see that um, UK and Southern Europe over a 2012 to 2030 period um, are in recession. Uh, West and Southern Europe have very marginal um, GDP growth. The employment scenario is a much more positive outcome, as you can see, across the board, um, and much more respectable figures. And this is pretty much, um, I haven't put a graph up here, I just thought I'd quickly summarise this, but it's, um, it's a pretty sort of uh, gradual trend over time, um, this GDP growth. So what did we do with employment? Now this is employment as a percentage of the working age population. Now, you'll see that it's um, gradually rising, and it has been rising since the 80s, um, pretty much across the blocks. Um, so the other issue with employment as a percentage of working age population is that across um, Europe, working age population is actually decreasing over time. So this percentage, it, it, it's not that um, sort of off the mark that we're expecting this to rise, because the working age population is de decreasing for various demographic reasons. So that's what um, sort of the objective of, of this scenario, of the employment scenario is, and that's the, sorry, I should explain, the red line that you're seeing is the employment scenario, so the more positive one, and the blue line is the um, austerity or sort of business as usual um, scenario. So they're the two things we're comparing. So what did we do with government expenditure in order to achieve that objective um, of that red line with employment? So you'll see the, um, again, the blocks on your left, that first column is the t figures for 2012, government expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Obviously, under the austerity scenario, you'll see by 2030 that there's a significant cut across the board, and it's really quite dramatic. If you look at the U figure for the UK, a decrease from 24.5 to 15.2% of GDP by 2030. Mm -hmm. And really, the main reason we put this up is to show you that in the employment scenario, we haven't actually boosted government expenditure so dramatically to get that outcome. And actually, we've pretty much kept it at 2012 levels across the blocks. Um, so we're not looking at this sort of dramatic increase um, that's, that's going to spiral budget deficits out of control. And in the UK, even, we've, um, we've diminished it slightly. So this isn't a sort of totally out there uh, scenario, or at least we hope it's not. Um, so what does it do to budget deficits? Okay, so in Western Europe, you'll see, again, the blue line is the business as usual um, case, the red line is uh, our employment scenario. So in, the, in Western Europe, um, not a, a huge difference, and you'll see pretty much getting back up towards um, a balanced budget by the end of the period. In the UK, similarly, we're achieving it later, but we are following a similar, tra similar trajectory. Um, the main problem is that yellow circle around Southern Europe, and this is... Um, a continued problem for us, and this is this is really sort of the crux of, of one of the issues we're having. 
Having said that, on Southern Europe, um, in terms of debt to GDP ratios, actually, our scenario isn't um, compares very favourably to the austerity or business as usual case. And this is because we have got employment, we have got incomes going up, we have got growth. So actually, debt to GDP ratios, as a result of an alternative employment scenario, are actually pretty much um, as good as, if not better, than the sort of business as usual austerity case. So I think that's an important point to make um, in southern Europe where, where this is a particular problem. Um, the final slide that I'm going to present, I'll hand over to Terry, is on the current account. And again, you'll see the two yellow circles are around southern Europe and eastern Europe, where the current account in our scenario is particularly unfavourable. Um, in eastern Europe, this is largely due to um, the bloc as a whole in our model joining um, the euro in 2015 and the impact that that has on current accounts. And in southern Europe, you'll see that the, the trend is a sort of downward one, and, and this is for structural reasons we're encountering this same problem of these twin deficits in southern Europe of the budget deficit and, and the current account. And that has really led us on to thinking about some of the implications of this for a more European-wide um, policy on exchange rates or on debt management in some way. And I'll hand over to Terry, who's been doing a lot of thinking on this, um, to tell you more. Just a, just a couple more slides. So as Hannah explained, um, I guess one of the advantages of the motto, it doesn't let you do everything you would like to do. It doesn't give you an ideal world. It, it sort of puts up some problems that you have to deal with in terms of policy making. And I'm just going to give you a, a few options that we're looking at. And in fact, we've also worked on to some degree in this Augur project. So you can see some of these results already in, uh, in the, the material coming out of that project. It's obvious with the current account and the fiscal uh, deficits that we have to do some other policy making here. And one major option is looking at exchange rate management. What can we do with exchange rates, for example, to deal with these current account deficits? One thing we've already tried, and that is Eurozone-wide depreciation to see what kind of effect that would have. To some extent, that does uh, deal with the problem of current account deficits, but what you immediately see is probably what you might expect, and that is, well, the deficits, the current account deficits of South Europe are reduced. At the same time, the current account surpluses of West Europe are going up quite dramatically. I don't have time to show you some of the results. So, you will improve the situation, but you'll have this sort of an inequitable, if you will, inequitable situation where Western Europe continues to gain from this exchange rate kind of arrangement that we have in the Eurozone. In the, in the uh, Augur project, and you can see it in the CDBR policy brief, there are some copies outside, we said, well, what if we're not talking about breaking up the Eurozone, but we're talking about making it more flexible. What if we had a multi-speed kind of Europe, a multi-speed management. You wouldn't break up the, the Eurozone, but you would have a more flexible arrangement in which you would manage real exchange rates based on allowing national, or in this case, the model, block-level Euros that would be pegged to a central Euro. That way you could perhaps deal with some of this inequality in terms of some some blocks or countries having, in a sense, overvalued exchange rates, being part of the Eurozone, and other blocks having, what I say, undervalued exchange <laughs> rates. So that tends to do quite well, up to a certain degree. But there are a lot of questions about how you would manage that, especially on the financial front. If you have pegged exchange rates that can move, then you need to have some kind of probably management of, of capital flows and be aware of the problem of speculation that, that could arise. But that is something worth looking into. The last uh, slide and the last major option, if you don't want to go that route, or if you want to combine that route, perhaps you need to look more at what you could do feasibly over this time period with more federal intervention. Enlarging the EU budget to begin with, we did that in the, in the uh, Augur project, up to 5% of GDP. Now it's around 1%, I believe. And 
you could also run an EU-wide deficit, right, through issuing euro bonds or other kind of instruments. The idea of both those, uh, those, both those options is really then to give you some room to have larger fiscal transfers to enhance investment at the block or, or national level in order to generate more growth and, again, to generate more employment, which is our main strategic objective. Even if you did that, we found already with some of our initial programming, you're still going to have to deal with debt relief. As you saw in South Europe, the, even with the employment scenario with growth, you still have relatively high debt to GDP ratios. We're going to have to uh, look at the option of some kind of debt relief, hopefully uh, dealt with at the EU level, at the uh, larger EU level, especially for South Europe. There's also a problem with East Europe, and it seems you can look at some of the graphs. When East Europe joins the Eurozone in 2015, you can almost see what was a rising trend, for example, in terms of the current account improving. It starts going the other way. So there's something we need to look at more in terms of the feasibility of, of East Europe joining the Eurozone in 2015. So now what we're doing actively, and hope, uh, unfortunately we don't have the results yet, is that we're shifting gradually to a system of fiscal transfers from West Europe to both South and East Europe, on the one hand. And now, not so much gradual, but quicker transfer of debt from blocks such, such as South Europe, in particular, to the federal level. And this, as a last footnote, given our own frustration with just working with blocks, we're going to be able to look at least at major large countries in the future in terms of the modeling, such as look at Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, as well as the UK, and perhaps even uh, Poland and Turkey. But when you get below the large countries, the reliability of the outcomes by the, the model, because it's a global model, uh, are questionable. So I leave it there. No, no big answers, but some uh, interesting directions to take, perhaps.